Hello, I'm Tim Harris. This is Julie Harris, and this is Real Estate Coaching Radio. That's right. So make sure that you hit the subscribe button so you won't miss any future episodes. Thanks again for popping by. Hit that like button, and don't forget to leave your comments and questions so we can get right back with you. We will. Thank you for continuing to make our podcast, Real Estate Coaching Radio, the number one listened to podcast for real estate professionals in at least the United States. And let us know what you think about this video. Leave your comments below. Thank you. Three, two, one, and we're back. Julie and I are focusing on something that seems to be on everyone's mind. Um, and it's, is now a great time to buy a home? This seems on the surface like a topic maybe that we'd be writing for the sake of consumers. And in a lot of ways we are. But what we're really focusing on with the points we're about to share with you guys are why now is a great time to buy a home. Why, frankly, if you're not, if you're sitting on the fence yourself, you personally should be buying a home. But also more importantly, and this is really where the drill down is going to be on today's show, is we want you to understand why now is a great time to buy a home. We're going to give you 14 reasons. And then, so that way you can feel confident, comfortable and confident because you're going to have the knowledge. Remember, knowledge equals confidence. Ignorance equals fear. When you're dealing directly with buyers and then maybe sellers that have to upgrade and buy a home as well. In other words, we have taken the time to cut through all the Mickey Mouse BS that's out there about real estate. And we're going to deliver to you the exact drill down 14 facts about why people should be buying homes now. And at the end of today's podcast, I would imagine most of you are going to feel very motivated to go out and shout these points from the tops of your you know, highest mountains in your community. So get ready. And again, all of our notes from all of our podcasts are always shared with you in the description of the show. So if you're on iTunes, you're on Stitcher, Spotify, we're on 30 different podcast listening widgets. And of course, over on YouTube, just scroll down and you'll see the show's description there. In addition to that, you're also going to see a link that we put up there so that you can join Premier Coaching. Now, remember with Premier Coaching, you can join for free and that does give you instant access to our daily semi-private coaching call with the Harris Certified Coach in addition to all the information that's available on the first level. So scroll down. And definitely read the notes, you know, cut and uh, paste the notes, use them for whatever you would like to use them for. A matter of fact, you could use these notes for uh, maybe creating a bunch of social media posts uh, that are consumer facing. If you're a team leader, a broker, an office manager, you could use these notes to educate your agents. All kinds of different benefits from this information. But most importantly, while you're there, definitely join Premier Coaching. The link is there. It's free. There's no risk to you. And this will definitely give you the direction, the motivation in your business that everyone needs, especially in this market. So listeners, are you wondering how to actually speak with your buyer prospects? What about your listing prospects who are also buyers? Is it still a great time to buy a home? Well, stop avoiding the conversation because you're freaked out about the shifting market. That comes in many different flavors, worrying about low inventory, worrying about where they're going to move, interest rates, our housing you know, prices going to crash, all that we will talk about on our points. But it is time to find the silver lining in a shifting market. And yes, it is still a great time to buy a home. We're going to give you, hopefully we'll get through all 14 uh, reasons, but let's get started. So the question is, is not, is it a good time to buy? The question is, will tomorrow be a better time to buy a home? Well, why or why not? You know, I was thinking about when I was reading your notes for today's show, Julie, I was thinking that it's, it could be argued, I think, and we're going to do it today, frankly, mm -hmm. that now is going to be the best time to buy a home in at least probably the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. In other words, waiting is going to, in a lot of cases, unfortunately, it's going to mean a lot of people won't frankly, they won't end up buying a home for at least 10 years, maybe mm -hmm. ever. There's this type of economy, this type of interest rate environment, all these things that are happening. They've happened before. Um, and the most obvious example would be in the 70s. There were a lot of people, my family was one of them, who stayed renters for a long period of time because the interest rates were too high. Home prices, in, you mm -hmm. know, relatively speaking, were too high. By the way, people were still buying and selling real estate when interest rates were close to 20%. So bottom line is, if you've got to set aside the expectations that interest rates are ever going to return to where they were, you know, 24 months ago, because they're just not. In matter of fact, they're going to stay at least at this rate. I know I'm stepping on one of your points. They're going to stay at least at this rate for a long period of time. And I'm teeing you up for your per first point, Julie Harris. Yes, that brings us to our first point. Interest rates are higher than in the pandemic years. We all know that but they are still historically low. Most of our listeners, you guys don't necessarily have a perspective on that. A global pandemic where the Fed throws money at the economy and simultaneously drives interest rates to the lowest ever recorded in history is not actually normal. Lock in your rate now, even when it's higher. And if it goes up, you're locked in. But if it goes down, you refinance. Date the rate, marry the home. So let's put some color on this. The average 30-year mortgage rate in the United States 
uh, between 1971 until 2023, the average was 7.74%, still higher than it is now. It did reach an all-time high of 18.63% in October of 1981 and a record low of 2.65% recently in January of 2021. So that gives you the high and low, but still the average from 71 until now was seven and three quarters percent. So it is still historically low. And again, I, I think, you know, just having it called the 30 year fixed kind of like subconsciously makes people think they're locked into that rate for 30 years. You're not, you can refinance, you can sell, you can keep it as a rental, you can pay it off. You know, we're going to talk about how many people pay cash in today's market. So don't freak yourself out continuously about interest rates. Point number two, Julie Harris. Point number two, in today's market, you may be able to negotiate with sellers who have been on the market more than 30 days. I see this from our coaches and our coaching clients every single day with their reports on the coaching calls. Uh, you might even be the only offer they're considering. You can have the home inspected, unlike before possibly renegotiate to handle any repairs, and maybe even pay less than 100% of the list price, and even get the seller to pay your closing costs in some cases. Additionally, you'll actually have more than one home to choose from. Inventory is inching, inching higher. So note to self, buyer's agents, do your homework on the listing before you make assumptions. There are still bidding wars out there, but there are also expired listings, longer days on the market listings, and sellers who are more motivated today than they were when they were freshly listed. So the essence of your point with point number two is in most markets, the buyers are going to be in control and the buyers are actually not just going to be, I think in many cases, not having to overpay. In some cases they still are, of course, Right. but you're all, I mean, overpay over list, but you're also looking at a situation where the house is going to be in a better condition. I mean, it wasn't even 24 months ago that you could have, a, you know, a, maybe a dubious location, an overpriced house in bad location or bad condition, and it would still sell with competing offers. Uh, because it was available, right? So yes, and in fact, in a later podcast this week, we're going to address what happens when your listing doesn't sell immediately, right? Because what we're seeing is a kind of a bifurcation where it's either going to sell right away the first weekend, maybe the second or it's going to sit around. So we're going to address that on a future podcast. We also, I know we're doing a podcast, hold on a second. <clears throat> proof that the show is live. Yes. We're, um, we're also, and we don't edit it. Uh, mm -hmm. We're also going to be doing a show this week on why there's not going to be a housing crash. Yes. But Julie, for the sake of today's notes, I really do think we should sprinkle a little bit of that in on today's notes, mm -hmm. you know, because there is not going to be a housing crash. I know a lot of you. It's the last point. So. Oh, it is the last point? Don't worry. It's oh, in man. there. Oh man, Julie has really thought <laughs> things through. I just need to shut up and basically. That's all good. You're, so you're going to, I'm, I'm goose to your. Uh, Maverick today. Maverick. <laughs> Julie's Maverick today. All right, <laughs> all right. Got it. That's okay. We'll get there. So point number three, in Inflation, another hot talking point these days, will cause home prices to continue to rise. Again, we're talking about why it is still a great time to buy. Waiting means your purchase price will be higher and so will your down payment requirement since that's based on a percentage of the purchase price. Your ratios could also be too high since the payment will be higher if you wait. So like, that's, that's such an incredible point. And this is something I know that's a little bizarre to try to understand. You, I'm sure, have all this memorized. So in the last Same. 24 months, what on average has been the inflation or appreciation of the average American home? Julie Harris? Okay, so let's split it into two parts, right? Between 2020 and 2022, so those were pandemic years, both you know, 2021 20, and 22. We really had three years of pandemic. Uh, according to Case Schiller, home prices nationally went up 45% on average. Now, there were places like Boise that did actually better than that, and there were places that maybe were a little bit less than that, but the national average is 45%. This year is looking like it's going to be 4 or 5%, which seems like a screeching halt to our listeners who are used to that outrageous appreciation slash inflation. So when you look at it that way, if we're only going up by 4%, it's really not catastrophic. When you look at it as the past four years, where three of the four years averaged 45%. Now, keep in mind too, it's easy to conflate inflation and appreciation. And just for the sake of this podcast, we'll just treat them both the same because the end result is the same. The house costs the more The growth money. rate of the home price. Exactly. The growth rate of the home price. So if you're you know, using Julie's example and you're borrowing money to buy a house and let's say the interest rate 7%, right? But the house is inflating or appreciating by more than what the cost every year by more than what the cost of the money is. In other words, you're uh, experiencing more inflation or more appreciation in the value of the home than the interest, the actual amount of interest you're paying to own that home for that, you know, 12 month period. You're in essence living in the house for free. 
And that's something that's really, really important that everybody understands. Matter of fact, here's an, an, kind of a crazy thing. In the last two years, because of all the inflation and appreciation, you have seen a, uh, and this has happened before, where you were getting paid to own a home. You know, literally, you were on the upside. You weren't just breaking even. Right. In this scenario, worst case scenario, I would say you're going to be breaking even. In this inflation that we're seeing, have you noticed, guys, that none of the talking heads are talking about inflation rate actually falling? Have you noticed that they're no longer looking for some sort of return to where prices were? It's because the inflation is now baked in. And if anything, and, uh, and again, we're not going to meander too much. If anything, the inflation is going to not just stay the same, but in many consumer items, the inflation rate is actually going to increase. If you guys dig down a little bit, you're going to see everybody, every manufacturer, every damn thing that you can possibly buy, the price has been increased. When the inflation rate originally, when inflation originally uh, started kicking in a couple years ago, what you saw were manufacturers of anything. What they were doing is they weren't raising their prices. They were reducing the quantity of what they were selling. That's when Cokes got small. That's, That's called shrinkflation. Right. What they did is they, they were selling for the same price, but they're selling less of what you were getting uh, prior. You didn't necessarily register in your mind that the Coke can was something the size that a Barbie would hold. But, you know, <laughs> right. that's what they were doing. But And what they were doing is waiting out to see if the inflation rate would go away. They weren't doing it to be greedy. Don't believe all that socialistic propaganda. They were doing it because the, they had to maintain margins to stay mm -hmm. in business. And their cost uh, to produce the products had increased because of inflation. They were trying to absorb that inflation by reducing their profits. And then when that didn't work, then they were trying to obviously reduce the quantity uh, not the quality, but the quantity of what they were selling. But now what you're seeing is not only have they reduced the quantity of what they were selling, but now they're actually having to substantially increase the price. I've seen that I read um, all kinds of different mm -hmm. you know, prices of things. And the cost of uh, furniture, the cost of cars. Sure. Car manufacturers now for the second year in a row are, in, uh, are re uh, increasing prices by 5 to 10% mm -hmm. year over year. So if you bought a car two years ago, I bet you uh, that that car is worth exactly what you paid because to replace the car with virtually the, the same car, rate. yeah, you're you're going to be paying a lot more. So you're seeing a lot of – this is all while the uh, economy and all these businesses settle into the new reality of inflation. And again, it looks like there's going to be uh, – the Fed has been talking about not raising rates anymore, not doing all the rest of these things. Um, and what is that going to mean ultimately? They're fearful that there's going to be some sort of really nasty turn in the economy. And it's, that would be something that would be cat, cat, cataclysmic. Cataclysmic. Thank yes, you. Indeed. Yes. And they're trying to avoid it. So there's a good chance that they're actually going to start printing money again. And then, believe it or not, lower rates, which will create more inflation. Yes. Yeah, so point number four, if you or your buyer prospects are paying rent, keep in mind that you're paying 100% interest, building zero equity, and you have all of the risk. So is that better to buy or better to rent? I would say it's better to buy. All right. Point number five, as one of my coaching clients says, all roads lead to transacting. <laughs> you know, I have to say though, in not every scenario, is it better to buy than it is to rent? There are, I think, unique circumstances sure. that people might find themselves in. And well, let's talk about that for a second. I would say a temporarily relocated executive who may or may not uh, have job security going forward 12, 24 months out. Maybe they're trying out a new position. Uh, military folks that may be deployed and I'll, will I'll be away. I'll disagree with you on the military you think, one. No, you because think it's I've better had, just to own? Because you and I have had plenty of coaching clients and people in our EXP group that were military, you know, specialized in military. And they, the smart, uh, what a lot of the military guys do is they go from base to base to base. Mm -hmm. They buy a home, they keep it, and they rent it. Fair enough. And then when they go to retire at the ripe old age of usually around 40, they built this really nice, impressive real estate, you know, That's portfolio. True. So I wouldn't, I'll say where you, I think hit the nail on the head when there's not, when there possibly could be a temporary move in the, you know, the, it's not a permanent position, mm -hmm. but I'll say really where the bottom line is, is it depends on the price point of the house. I would agree with that. So you can't, if the pr house of the price, if the price of the house uh, makes it so that to cover the cost of the house, if you were to try to rent it out, you'd lose money. That's really where it starts to get a little bit dubious. So expensive yeah. real estate, really expensive mm -hmm. real estate, you might be in some cases better off if you do rent versus own. Sure. I think everybody has to run their own math. And if you're a premier coaching client, you do have a rent versus own calculator on the website. Right. But the irony, again, of mm -hmm. upper end buyers and upper end sellers is they're not really that concerned. I like Rob Johnson, I'm thinking in Greenwich, Connecticut, we've mm -hmm. coached for years. You know, his average sale price has got to be $5 million. Right. And for a long time, it's corrected post-COVID, but 
people were losing money big time on their mm -hmm. houses. It was normal to walk into a situation with a seller and they were losing, you know, three, four or $5 million. Well, I remember like, his price reductions were in the millions, not in the hundred thousands. But was the, here's the takeaway because the market had been in that position for a long period of time. There was no real worries, worry or debate about, you know, okay, you're going to lose $2 million. Well, I put addition in and I did all the rest of this work. Well, you're still losing $2 million right. and people were still buying. And why were they buying? They're buying because for lifestyle, they're buying because it's something they wanted. They were treating it a house in Greenwich, Connecticut as a consumer item, basically. Like when you'd buy a car knowing that five years from now, the car was going to be worth half of what you paid for it. That's kind of how they were thinking of real estate. But remember, this was a very, very upper end. I'm sure, you know, in many cases, people were worth tens of millions of dollars. So they didn't really care that yeah. much if they were going to lose because they wanted to be in that particular neighborhood for their kids grew up in a particular you know, school Other system. Other reasons. Right, exactly. Well, so that gets down to knowing your client, knowing your inventory, knowing their financial situation, and not making assumptions or presumptions that all of your clients are the same or that they all think like you do. But also, you just said it, not everyone buys. Very, very, very few people uh, buy with the, with financial, with their financial, you know, that's not what they're leading with. Most consumers are buying because they want a lifestyle. Yes. They want to, again, live in a per particular place or have that particular, you know, box checked in their life. They want to buy a cabin in a mountain. They want to buy a house near a beach, that type of thing. They're not buying with the idea that it's going to be a Willy Wonka golden ticket. That's no. how Unless you you're a flipper. No, right. That might be how you think fellow yeah. real estate professional, but that's not how normal people think. Normal people do not think about money the way we are all, you know, led to believe that they do because they don't. And, you know, that goes to really understanding, as Julie just said, the nature of the client. That's right. And, you know, the past, you know, three to five years, especially, it would be easy to believe that they were all in it for the money because every time you sold something, there was a big pot of gold at the end. But yes, people move because of circumstances, not necessarily leading with whatever they're going to make. Okay, point number five, when you do pay rent, you are not locked into anything for more than a year, two years if you're lucky. The owner can sell the home, raise your rent payment, or simply not renew your lease. So renting comes with its own uh, uncertainty. So we just had to, you know, examine that a little bit. But again, drill down on that. Again, this information we're hoping you're going to present to your potential buyers and sellers that have to buy. If they stay renting, there's a 100% guarantee rents are going to increase because as inflation increases, so will the cost of for the landlord to own the property. The guy to cut the grass, the cost of the utilities, certainly property taxes. Mm -hmm. If the local, like Julie and I have properties in many different states and... I promise you that all of our property taxes are increasing because the 100%, house, yeah. yeah, I mean, <laughs> think of our, the, we have properties in Texas and the taxes, there are like the 2% or something. Yep. Right. And so every time and every year the houses appreciate mm -hmm. or inflate in value. Well, that I have that tax assessor, you know, they know exactly what the houses are inflated to, and they're going to raise the property taxes, which means we're going to have to raise the cost of the rent on, you know, for the tenant mm -hmm. and everything else goes up as well. So you are 100% locking in a future increase in your cost of living when you are a renter. Now, you still will have increased property taxes as a owner, but at least the vast majority of your expense you're going to have, you're going to know what it is because your interest rate is going to be locked. Well, so point number six is related to that. When you pay rent, you're guaranteed to be paying more next year, even if it's by a little bit, unless you want to move, assuming the owner still wants to lease to you. Don't forget the cost of actually moving. You can't just refinance or renegotiate your rent payment. That doesn't fly. It's funny that landlords are less negotiable than some banks are on that stuff, right? But that's on the residential side. Mm -hmm. On the, the commercial side, we have a lot. Well, of, that's different. Yeah, we have a lot of commercial agents in our EXP Realty Group, mm -hmm. and that's pretty much what all of them are living in fear of: is these long-term tenants um, in renegotiating, renegotiating, and they're going to have to. Well, and that's a different can of worms, isn't it? Yep. So point number seven, when you purchase a home, you're securing an asset and releasing yourself from the liability of renting. Now, point number eight, owning real estate allows you to have more versatility of that asset. You can live in it. You could rent it, make it a vacation rental, refinance and pull equity from it, home office in it, or sell it. You've got versatility of that asset. For those of you that have owned three, four, five, maybe even more single family homes that you've lived in, you know, how many of those houses, like if you're thinking back to all the real estate you've owned personally, again, how many would you love to own now? I'm going to guess <laughs> all of them. Yeah, we did. Well, yeah, we, we only sold two, right? No, we sold yeah. three. Yeah. yeah. And I wish we owned all of them. Mm -hmm. I know that's the thing is that real estate, uh, if you think of it, is going to be in an inflationary environment, which we're going to be in for probably at least 10 years in a meaningful way. 
hard assets like real estate in particular are going to be one of the best ways, not just to maintain wealth, but also to build wealth because of the inflation. That's right. So point number nine, if you can only afford to purchase a home at the lower mortgage interest rate, maybe you or your borrower was pre-approved at the lower rate, you still do have options. And here are some of them. Lower your purchase price, go a little bit down market, change the type of mortgage that you're getting, get gift money to make your down payment larger, get the seller to pay for a rate buy down and lock it in. Or of course you can possibly decide to wait. But don't assume that your only option is that 30-year fixed at the higher rate. And now, we'll, we'll do dedicated podcasts on that in the future, too. Now, this next point is going to blow a lot of your minds. This is always something that we always get great feedback on when we share this with you guys. Because so many of you have only been in the business for like 15 years or less. So you're not familiar with what is a bank overlay. Yes. And remember... I just listened to a podcast about the the whole banking crisis, which kicked a lot of this off, in, plus the inflation and all the other reasons. So what are we talking about? Point number 10, bank overlays will get more stringent if the economy continues to decline. That means the requirements for financing will become more onerous, not less. Those, again, are called bank overlays. If you or your buyer or buyers are deciding to wait, take the time to work on credit scores. Experian.com has some great tools and pay down your debt because that's going to improve your ratios. When we talk about bank overlays, that could mean something like, okay, so you've got a 720 credit score, that's great, but your job history is only two years and our bank overlays say you have to have five or you need a 750 or higher credit score. Okay, so let's break that down even and more. And by the way, agents, because I see them post on social media about this, bank overlays are not illegal. Right, so what happens is that Fannie Freddie, which most people are using government back financing, they have specific, like, you, you know, your borrower has to have an average credit score of this. They have to have this time, of, you know, this much money down. The ratios have to be this. So here's the list of requirements for the government to actually approve that loan. But that's not the whole ball of wax. What banks, and they do this even in the best of times, but they're definitely going to be doing it because they're fearful of a recession. There are going to be overlays that then take those base core requirements from the government and then they put a whole bunch of other requirements on top of that. So when you're reading online or your, your, your buyer's reading online, well, I qualify for this based on a Fannie Mae loan. Okay, now you take that um, and you approach the local bank who is a Fannie Mae approved lender, and they're going to have a whole bunch of other crap on top of whatever that is. Mm -hmm. and, and the banks do this without announcing it. You'll have to dig around to find out what their overlays are. They don't are. have to disclose it. No. But here's how it manifests. You'll have, or maybe even yourself, but you'll have a borrower that seems really super strong. They've got good credit. They've got good ratios, this and that and the other. And their pre-approval letter, uh, you know, their lender letter will come back and it'll say something like, you're approved, but you have to pay off a $10,000 credit card in order to close, well, let's right? Use, let's use a salient example. Sure. I'll, I'll use a good, a good So <clears throat> okay. I remember very clearly in 2007, you and I were, our neighbors were very, very good uh, home flippers. Residential and, home Residential flippers, home flippers. Yeah. And they had a, a line of credit from Bank of America off their own home that basically was providing all the liquidity for them to flip houses. Right. And they did a great job. Tim they and did. Susie. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So what happened was I was standing in my driveway and he just started this conversation, which I, you know, wasn't really prepared for. But the essence of the conversation was talking about how their Bank of America line of credit was just essentially eviscerated. So what Bank of America did, and I'll make up numbers here just so you guys can understand. Let's say their Bank of America line of credit was a million dollars or 500,000. It was a lot. Well, let's say against that line of credit, they had borrowed 50,000. So they still had all of this available credit that they could use to do in their next flip. What the bank did is it reduced their total maximum amount that they could borrow to that 50,000 that they'd already borrowed. Yep. In other words, they were immediately cut off from being able to use what was their, in their thinking, their money, their line of credit, the bank cut it off. Okay, now keep in mind that that was not because Tim and Susie did anything wrong, right. okay? That was because the bank had their risk managers say, you know what, looks like the real estate market's hitting the fan. Maybe we wanna put a clamp down on these home equity line of credit. Okay, so it happened with home equity lines of credit, but here's also where it happened, on credit cards. For example, mm -hmm. American Express, there's no balance, you're supposed to pay it off every single month, there's no limit, right? Well, guess what American Express did to a lot of real estate agents? If you were in the real estate business, they knew it, 
And what they did is they would absolutely positively put a maximum amount that you could charge on the American Express card, even if you had stellar credit, even if you've been making your payments online. So let's say you run your business through American Express and you run all your personal life through American Express. And let's say you run, you know, 20, 25,000 through every single month. Well, now what would American Express did overnight, because they were fearful of the storm clouds on the real estate horizon mm -hmm. back in 2007, is they limited, they would limit your the previously unlimited amount that you could charge every month down to like 3,500 bucks. And there wasn't a damn thing you could do about it. No. And this was again, because of the bank's risk, not because of the borrower's risk. Right. So that's something you really have to look out for as we have, you know, the banking uh, crunch, we're not calling it a crisis so much, but the risk managers are definitely on the prowl and they're definitely tightening up requirements. You will be affected by that by uh, credit scores, ratios, amount required down, type of loan you may or might not be able to be approved for. So if you're taking a pause or your buyers are, it's a great time to work on credit scores and to pay down debt and to really run your own ratios. Or get off pause and get back to or work just because <laughs> things most likely are going to you know, be tougher loan-wise. I just don't see how that's... 100% true. It's already happening. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And don't argue with the lender if you get a letter back like that. That is real. You do have to take care of it or switch lenders and maybe they, they'll they change it. Or by the way, ask your lender, your loan officer, make sure Larry the lazy lender isn't basically, you know, not doing his job. Find out what the overlays are. Oh yeah, I'm an FHA lender. I can get your borrow into that great FHA deal that they read about online or whatever. Okay. What are your overlays, Larry? Oh, but, 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 but. What do you have to do? Oh, their ratios have to be this stellar. Right. What are their ratios now? Oh, well, they're off by a few points. Okay, oh, better fix that. They have to have actually, he had to have actually been a fireman for five years. He's only been a fireman for two years. Well, now the overlay says he had to have been in the same industry, yeah. working a same job, earning the same money for at least five years. And now that he doesn't, guess what? That's an overlay. He no longer qualifies for one. Y stuff <laughs> like that. Yeah, pain in the neck stuff, right? And they'll even, there's a lighter version of that, which which would be something like, uh, you know, your borrower has to supply an employment letter of verification stating that they're likely to be a fireman in the next two years. I've seen that too. Yep. I know you guys all think this is weird stuff, but it's real. Okay. <laughs> all right. Point number 11, compare your worst case scenario renting versus owning. Let's say you actually do lose your job. Your lender will be easier to deal with than a landlord who may have their own issues and will simply evict you versus your lender who can put your loan into forbearance while you get back on your feet. And we actually think that in markets, if there are, uh, you know, there are going to be areas of the country, there always are, even in the best of times, where there's a major employer that, you know, goes out of business for whatever reason. And then all the homeowners in that particular area, they are without a job. And the next thing you know is prices start to fall on homes. And then, you know, the foreclosure waves start happening. That is inevitable. That'll happen in the best of times. That's just the nature of, you know, housing and real estate and the economy. And that now, is point number 12, if you read that. Okay, I will. And what I'm leading into here is we already know, and Julie's about to read point number 12, we already know exactly how the government is going to force the banks to treat people that are on, that are experiencing hardship and an inability to make their payments. And that is? Point number 12, most homeowners can temporarily pause or reduce their mortgage payments if they're struggling financially. Forbearance is the word. Forbearance is when your mortgage servicer or lender allows you to pause or reduce your mortgage payments for a limited time while you build back your finances. And in most cases, your credit score is not harmed by that. The key here is that you or whoever is you know experiencing that, your borrower, uh, the homeowner has to actually communicate with the bank. You can't just expect them to do that. But yes. And how do we know this? Because of, you know, that little black swan event that we just had called COVID. Right. Where this was tested and we know how that reaction is going to be. We know what the banks are going to do. We know how they're going to act. We know how the process is going to work. A lot of you were listening to us back when COVID started and they started doing this forbearances. And Julie and I were shouting to the highest mountaintops, absolutely positively put your mortgage into forbearance. Absolutely do it, even if you have no financial worries, because there's zero downside. The unpaid interest in the loan goes in the back of the loan, but then you at least can save the money, put the money in a bank account and save the money that you would have otherwise been making towards your payment. You're not like, you know, taking advantage of, you're not going to not pay. You're going to pay at, if, when you go to sell the home. 
They don't recast the loan. The payment stays the same. And you are reducing your monthly overhead by whatever your house payment was for at least 12 months. There is no downside to that. That is exactly what the government is going to do if there's any sort of regional recession or in yep. some cases where there's you know a real housing problem. They will absolutely allow those people to put their homes in forbearance. For how long? Well, go and know what the real number is or the real amount of time? Indefinitely. How do we know? Because that's what they did before. There are still people to this day at, after COVID is, you know, in the rear view that still have their mortgages in forbearance or only making partial payments. Nobody wants a housing crisis, no. much less the government. Okay. Point number 13, owning a home or several is a forced savings account. Most people have their greatest store of wealth in the form of home equity. Over time, it is still the greatest investment you can make with the most versatility. How do we know? NAR chief economist Lawrence Yoon said, quote, a monthly mortgage payment is often considered a forced savings account that helps homeowners build a net worth about 40 times higher than that of a renter. I looked that up. That is absolutely true. So, And yet, it is fascinating to me that uh, there are so many people out there that essentially the socialists or the Marxists out there mm -hmm. who don't even know that's really what they're preaching, who want to have some sort of nationalized housing where somehow there's an inequality in housing and how, why is it that some people have all this and some people have all this and all the rest of it. There always are inequalities. They're all, especially in things, you know, like in real estate, there's always going to be a time, there's always going to be people that can rent and never can buy it. That's just the nature of it. My family was one of them until they finally bought a house. Um, and that's always going to be a problem. It's always going to be a challenge. There's always going to be people that are always going to feel like they're the haves versus the have nots or the have nots versus the haves. So you got to be watching how every time there's any kind of even remote, um, you know, uh, I'd say smoke on the horizon where all these doomsdayers come out of the woodwork and they start preaching that there's going to be a housing crash preaching that somehow it's the end of the American dream of owning a home, how they, uh, where they get their information from is always dubious. They make it up because what they're trying to do is convince you uh, for whatever their motivations are that America is on its heels or, you know, the best years are behind us and all the rest of it. Julie and I have been noticing, and of course it makes sense because the nature of the economy right now, we've been noticing that there's a lot more talk about America's best days are behind it. I'm going to just address that real quick and I'll get back on it. Okay. okay. So the, it, there, people are comparing right now what's happening in the United States. And I see this happening from Ray Dalio, for example, you know, they're talking about how it's fall, you know, we're at, in the twilight of the, you know, American, you know, experiment. Mm -hmm. And just like previous countries that have been dominant in, in world powers, there was Spain, there was England, there was Italy. There was of course, you know, we can use Roman Previous Empire because it lasted, you know, thousands of years. Well, I want you to keep in mind, the United States is barely 300 years old. And so if you're comparing us to the you know, Roman Empire, for example, that lasted 2,000 years, doesn't that barely make our country uh, essentially a preteen? I mean, barely, really, if that. In essence, yeah. we're just getting started. To, and to, to believe, and, and the, every scenario, if you look at sort of what the, what the parallels were in these previous empires, just using words here, what... They had uh, dominance in usually military. They had dominance in other things. But we have so much more dominance in all the most important things in the economy. We have dominance in healthcare. We have dominance in computer chips. We have dominance in uh, military. We have dominance in, by the way, the money supply for the world. We have dominance for the creation of new jobs. We have, here's another thing. China is going to take over the world and they're going to, no, they're not. They have a massive demographic problem. Their one one child policy is actually not, you know, it, they have a problem with the not enough younger people in China. And so they're going to have a big drop off in consumers in, in their domestic economy. They're going to have a massive recession that's going to last forever. Uh, we don't have any of those problems. We have all the exact uh, challenges. We have too many people wanting to come here. Right. And so don't believe that the best days for our country or the best days for you individually are behind you. They're absolutely positively not. And when you hear people that are, you know, pissing in the well, basically, you've got to really stop and ask what their motivation is for thinking and acting that way. And by the way, do make a real effort to avoid people like that, because all they do is they suck the life out of you. Because if you don't, if you don't believe this isn't about being an optimistic or a pessimist, this is just looking at historic history, right? If you don't believe your tomorrow is going to be vastly better than today, wash, rinse and repeat. You're going to do things today that are going to pretty much lock in your tomorrow being worse than today. In other words, if you don't believe 
that you're in the right industry at the right time in the right country. Everything in your life is aligned perfectly. Uh, and if you don't actually feel that way and then uh, start taking actions, reinforcing that thought, you're going to most certainly make your future not as good as your past. Do you guys understand? So you've got to be really, really efficient at pruning anybody and anything that is, for the most part, trying to, again, piss in the well. And they don't even use facts. They're not even, when you hear yeah. Julie's last point, when you hear all these, you know, uh, foreclosure bros talking their crap, they're not using facts at all. Even they're, if they speak about it confidently, which I think is kind of next door to evil, you know, because they, they say it with such enthusiasm, it would be easy to believe it. And yet there's not a single fact behind it. Right. They can't back up. And again, this happens mostly in the mainstream media, frankly, when you read about anybody predicting any kind of you know, fall of the empire or, you know, real estate no longer being the American dream. Okay. Why do you think that? Blah, 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 blah. No facts. They're not no hitting facts. you with information. And, and they say things that are nefarious, like, oh, there's, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of homes that are in shadow inventory. Well, why do they call it shadow inventory? Because how are you going to research that? It sounds like something, it doesn't exist. but it means nothing. It's all a lie. And so when, okay, here's another one. I, there's the government's getting ready for huge waves of foreclosures and short sales. Okay. I know you're lying, but now I'm going to ask if, you know, I'm going to ask a few questions to find out if you know you're full of shit. And then you ask a few questions and then the answer is, oh, I'm under NDA. I can't disclose why oh, yeah. I know that. No, you're not. You're lying. You're making it up. It's crickets. Yep. Okay. Which leads us to point number 14. Last but not least, there will not be a big housing crash. Supply and demand, demographics, forbearances for those who fall behind, super high equity, locked in low interest rates, and low inventory are all reasons you should not expect a precipitous drop in prices. Now, that was a lot wrapped up in point number 14 because we have done dedicated podcasts, which really greatly expand on that point. And we're doing another one this week. And we are doing another one this week, which are giving you the top points. Here's the thing. Today's podcast and several this week are to give you talking points. Why? Because knowledge equals power. We've been giving you facts. Ignorance equals fear. It's our job to educate, motivate, and get you into action. It's your job to educate, motivate, and get your prospects into action by talking about all this stuff, not being a secret agent, not being afraid to have conversations. Now, again, Julie and I really were trying to hit home, especially in the last few points, because if you believe, if you actually believe there's going to be some sort of housing crash, or if you believe that uh, you know real estate's going to depreciate, if you're actually operating like that, you're not ever going to want to sell somebody a house, assuming you're not a sociopath, because you don't want that person to experience financial hardship, especially if like maybe they care, maybe they don't. But in the back of your mind, you're thinking, do I want to sell this house to somebody if I think or if I believe or I just read an article on you know doomsday.com that real estate's going to plummet down to like right. 50% you're probably not going to be that enthusiastic about what you do for a living. So you've got to be basing your behavior on facts. And I know that a lot of you like to base your behavior on your emotions. Well, the problem is the emotions will always betray you because your emotions are going to change. On this podcast for the past 37 minutes, how frequently have your emotion, uh, how, how frequently has your emo have your emotions changed, right? They've gone from, well, that's interesting to, huh, I don't agree with that. Do I really agree with that? Or I really like their energy and enthusiasm, right? That is exactly why you cannot trust your emotional state because your emotional state changes all the time. And by the way, it's also easily manipulated. So mm -hmm. you need to lean into the fact that most of your prospective consumers are also, you know, essentially emotional yo-yos. And if you are coming to them with confidence uh, from your facting them, basically, mm -hmm. they're going to not only want to do business with you, but they're going to they're going to respect you and they're going to be some of your center, best centers of influence and past clients ever because you approach a, a conversation with them about investing in real estate that in the near future, let alone five, 10 years from now, they will be so grateful that you did, right? When that house inflates in value by seven or 8% in the next say year and a half, and they have increased their net worth by seven or 8% in the next year and a half, if not even more, don't you think that person's going to love you forever? Of course they are. <laughs> of course they are. But it's because you're using facts, not fiction. And I want to circle back to something you said at the top of this podcast. We presented 14 points. All of these points could be social media posts, yep. many videos, certainly phone calls. You need to have these conversations and be ready when somebody says, maybe you meet a buyer, a prospective buyer at an open house. Maybe they even have a potential listing and they say, you know what? I'm not going to do anything until prices fall. Well, now you'll know how to have a real conversation about that. And it's also, we should have addressed that, but we will on another show this week. 
So there's a difference between depreciation in real estate, values falling versus sellers reducing their price. And you got to be really clear in your head. Now there are markets where, so for example, if you bought in the second half of 2022, I think, mm -hmm. chances are you have, if you paid a million for your house in San Francisco, chances are that, and let's say you bought it in June, by the time December rolled around, it probably was worth less than what you paid for it. But guess what? You hold the house for 2023 and then 2024. It was the, temporary. The inflation will more than make up whatever you were on paper in the red on. You guys get it? So what you're hearing are people that are, I think, frankly, lying to you intentionally, trying to get you to believe there's some sort of, you know, dark career, uh, real estate, you know, bust on the horizon mm -mm. who are conflating sellers reducing their prices with depreciation of home values. If you put a house for sale for $500,000 and the mark and the seller say bought it for $200,000 and they have all this equity in it and they want to put it for sale, they, I want 500 grand, just, you know, that's what it has to be fine. And then they end up having to sell it for say 475. Did that house really depreciate? Or did the seller just have to reposition the house in the market to correctly reflect the buyer's expectations? In other words, yeah. did they actually just have to price it correctly or is there depreciation? So what you're seeing on the headlines are is depreciation. The houses are, re people are reducing their prices. So what? They were overpriced. Yeah. We're not talking about upside down here, folks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We'll get into that on a future podcast. So now you have your talking points. You have no excuse but to get out there and talk to more people about real estate so you can be more transactional. If you love this podcast, which we know tens of thousands of you do because this is the number one listened to daily podcast for real estate professionals in at least the United States, please do give us a five-star review on iTunes and please do include a comment about why specifically this podcast has helped you in your real estate business. We sincerely appreciate it. The five-star reviews go a long way. Think of it this way. This podcast costs you nothing, right? We're not charging for this. Many people think we should, but we won't. Um, and so the way you can maybe, I think, um, pay us back if you want to just use real words is to give us a five-star review over on iTunes. We certainly appreciate it. You guys have a fantastic day. We'll talk with you on the show tomorrow. Hello. Thank you for having watched this video. Please remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's right. And don't forget to hit that like button, leave your comments and questions below, and we will get right back with you. Thank you for watching this video. Remember to watch the next one. You're going to love that one.